Well, we're continuing our study in the book of Ephesians. And the Apostle Paul has taught his audience, the church at Ephesus, and speaking to us too, that they and we live in a new identity in Christ. Before we really dive into the passage this morning, which is in Ephesians 5, 15 through 21, I think it'd be best that we took a look at and beneficially we see where it places in the epistle. This passage we're about to consider brings Paul's exhortation to the church in general, and he calls us to walk worthy of the calling, and it brings it to a conclusion. We know in chapters one through three of the book, and Tony, Pastor Tony's done an excellent job on teaching that, we find our position in Christ, who we are in Christ, and it's so beneficial that we really know that. We need to know who we are. But beginning in chapter 4, verse 1, we started to see a change. It continues through our passage today. And Paul has a church as a whole in mind when he exhorts them to walk worthy of the calling which you've been called. We've encountered the metaphor of walking seven times in the book of Ephesians. In chapter 2, verse 1, we read, And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of darkness. Then in chapter 2, verse 10, the apostle Paul said, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, We hear Paul say, I therefore, prisoner of the Lord Jesus, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. And in verse 14 of that chapter, we read, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the fertility of their minds. Chapter 5, verse 2, which we took a look at a few weeks ago, it says, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And in 5.8, Pastor Tony just did this message recently. For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. And then we come to our passage today in verse 15 of chapter 5. And it says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. And it's very clear that Paul is concerned and wants to open our thinking and and the the Christians in Ephesus to the change that's taking place in us by the word of God and by the spirit of God, the power of the spirit, to produce a new walk, a new way of life that fits our new creation. You know you're a new creation in Christ. You know that, right? Okay, good. And as I've said up to this point, Paul has had the church as a whole in view as he's urged us to walk worthy of that in Jesus Christ. But I just want to take a little glance ahead, and Pastor Tony's going to to, uh, focus on this in the next couple of weeks. In chapter 5, verse 22 through 33, he'll address the relationship between husband and wife. In in chapter 6, verse 1 through 4, he discusses the relationship between between parents and children. And then in uh, chapter 6, verse 5 through 9, he'll address the relationship between, it says, bond servant and master or boss and worker. It's not until chapter 6, verse 10, that he turns his attention once again to the Christians in general to offer his final exhortations before concluding the book and the letter. So, we need to understand that here in chapter 5, verse 15 through 21, we have the conclusion of this section that began in chapter one, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, where Paul exhorts the Christian in general and the church as a whole to walk worthy of the manner of the calling to which you have been called. I know I've repeated that numerous times, but we need to understand that we need to walk worthy of the, of the calling that, we, that God has put on us. I've titled my message, be wise, be filled. Let's read Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. 
It says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not uh, be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And do not get drunk with wine, for it is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so Paul concludes this section of his epistle by really encouraging two things. He encourages us as Christians to walk in wisdom. And he also encourages us as Christians to be filled with the Spirit. So this is going to be our focus today. We're going to look at what it is to have wisdom in our life and what it is to walk in the Spirit. So we need to ask ourselves a question this morning. What is godly wisdom? And first, let's first consider his encouragement to walk in wisdom. In verse 15, it says, Look carefully then how you walk. In other words, be careful. Now, uh, two years ago, a little over two years ago, uh, you can put that picture up of my wonderful dog, all right? We got a dog, it was a gift, given to my son, Justin. And uh, it was a dog that was promised to him and I never thought it was gonna happen, so I kind of went along with it. And all of a sudden we got a phone call and it said, oh, your pup's been born, and so we waited. And his name is Surprise, S-I-R, P-R-I-Z-E. That's because he was a surprise. They weren't expecting him, and I wasn't expecting him. So we drove upstate, we picked him up. Wonderful gift. You've heard some stories about my dog. He hasn't always been the most well-behaved dog. I'll leave it at that. But when I got that dog, I determined that I was never going to step in his mess. So when I go in my yard, I walk carefully. Now the yard gets cleaned up twice a week, and if we're mowing the lawn, it's an extra time we gets cleaned up. So it's not like everything's all over. But <clears throat> when I'm out in my yard, I'm watching every step I take. And, and I know by telling you that I'm really setting myself up here because probably something's gonna happen because I told you it's never happened, all right? But you know what, I'll keep you posted. If I get up one Sunday and I say it happened, <laughs> you'll know what I'm talking about, okay? But it says in this passage of scripture, what, what does it look like to walk carefully? What is godly wisdom? Wisdom is a capacity of the mind that allows us to understand life from God's perspective. Godly wisdom goes against the conventional wisdom of the day. It's not focused on self-preservation, but on furthering the kingdom of God. With worldly wisdom, uh, we, become, we can become educated, street smart, and have common sense that enable us to play the world's game successfully. Worldly wisdom is not concerned with honoring God, but with pleasing oneself. With godly wisdom, we trade earthly values for biblical values. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't wise people in the world that don't know the Lord. There are. I mean, there's wise people in finance and well, I wanted to say government, but I'm a little hesitant to say that. <laughs> All areas, you see wisdom. And I really believe that there's kind of two things that operate in our world. There's laws and there's principles, okay? Now, just to give you an illustration, the law is, let's take the law of gravity, for instance. You have nothing to do with it. You have no choice about it. It just happens. You're stuck to the earth, okay? You don't decide that. But principles are something that you can enact in your life, something that you can incorporate in your life. And I truly, the, the scriptures are full of principles. And I really believe that if you'll take the principles of the word of God and apply them in your life, you'll benefit from those. You will. Even an unbeliever will benefit from those. Because we talk about honesty, integrity, and things like that. When you live your life like that, you're going to benefit from that in some way. So I'm not knocking like, wisdom in the world. But I'm saying that wisdom in God is a whole different story. Wisdom is the art of godly living. 
To be wise is to live a life according to the truth. A wise person lives his or her life according to the word of God. A wise person obeys God's commands. So how do we get this wisdom? How is it obtained? And I'm going to just go through some biblical instructions on how to get wisdom. First of all, it begins with the fear of God. It begins with the fear of the Lord. In Proverbs 9:10, it says so famously, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, of, of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. And we see that it's impossible to walk in wisdom without first fearing God. Now, when we talk about fearing God, it doesn't mean that we need to cower in the corner and worry about what God's going to do to us. It means that we have a, a reverence and a respect for who God is. We understand he's God, we're not. And we lift him up and exalt him and praise him for that. He stands alone. There's none like him. And as we grow in, our, in wisdom and knowledge, our knowledge, as we grow in wisdom, our knowledge of him increases. Understanding who God is and giving him honor and respect due to him is where wisdom begins. Wisdom increases as we learn over time and with much patience to obey God's word and to choose the best path that, as we sojourn through this life. Those who uh, are wise walk like God. They emulate the life of Jesus. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 8, say it well. Trust in the Lord with your, all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. So we see that it's so important that we learn the fear of the Lord. Second thing that helps us grow in wisdom is we have to desire wisdom. It's a second step in getting wisdom is desire it with all our hearts. As Solomon said, and it was read in the passage today, Pastor Tom read, we must look for it as silver and search for it as a hidden treasure. We must seek it out, desire it. Another way that we grow in wisdom is we need to pray for wisdom. As James tells us, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given you. God will give wisdom out in generous proportion if we ask him for it. Now, the, the scripture does say, don't be double-minded. Don't ask for God for wisdom and then not, you know, accept it when it happens, you know? I know, I, I, I remember having a conversation with my mother after I was a Christian, and she said to me, you know, I used to pray God would save you, and then I'd take you back, you know? <laughs> when I finally let you go and said, God, you do it, that's when it happened, you know what I mean? And we do that sometimes. We go, God, give me wisdom, and then we start working it out on our own. Okay. Another way we grow in wisdom is by studying God's word, studying and meditating on God's word. And we need to realize that the Bible is God's instructional manual for for living life. Psalm 119, 105 says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Another way we receive wisdom is by receiving it from others. We can also develop godly wisdom by carefully selecting those who journey with us through this life. Surrounding ourselves with people that have wisdom. Proverbs 3.20 says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. We gain wisdom through having godly mentors, and teachers, and friends. We need to surround ourselves with godly people. And this is a good reason why we need to be in fellowship with one another. Now, you're here this morning, so, I mean, this, these next couple of comments aren't really directed at you, but there's people that have stayed away and they have lost the value of coming together. They've forgotten how important it is that we come together. And so if you're watching online this morning, this is not a personal attack in any way, but hey, you need to get back to church. We need you here and you need to be here. So we'll leave it at that, okay? But that is a good reason why we fellowship together with one another. 
I want to give you some signs this morning if you're wondering, am I growing in wisdom? Now, this won't come up on the screen. This kind of came after we put this all together, so bear with me. But if you're growing in wisdom, you have the ability to hold your tongue. The Bible says a fool, a fool gives full vent to his spirit, his spirit, but a wise man holds it back. And I know we're in a culture where it says, speak your mind. Some of us would be better off not doing that. Trust me. All right? And it's, it's, it's actually biblical. All right? If you're growing in wisdom, you're going to learn, you know, what to say and when to say it. You just, God helps us with that. And it's really important. And then also, if we're growing in wisdom, we have the ability to make good decisions. It says in Isaiah 30, 21, and your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. When you turn to the right or turn to the left, God wants to provide us with good decisions. And you know, we need to make good decisions. If you're a young person sitting here this morning and you're thinking about your future and what you're supposed to do, you got to put that in God's hands. God will guide you and direct you if you look to him. He'll help you with that. And if you're older, we need, we need good decisions. We really do. It's really important. And then we also have the ability to impart wisdom to others. Solomon, who was, the Bible tells us, was the wisest man in uh, all the earth. The scriptures tell us that ambassadors would come from other countries just to sit with him. And here is wisdom. Now he lost it at the end a bit, okay? But he was wise, and people came to him, and he shared his wisdom with them. If we're growing, if we're growing in wisdom, we have the ability to lean on God in trials. We read it this morning, Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with your own heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. When you're going through something and you just don't know what to do, don't try to figure it out. Don't try to make the plan. Don't try to make it happen. Put your confidence and trust in God. And also we have the ability to let God fight our battles. When you're in a fight, let God fight your battle. It says, be still and know that I'm God. When you're in a difficult spot and you don't know what to do and you're going through something, just turn it over to God. God, you help me with this. Give me the right things to do and say and not to say. And then also we have the ability to get angry without sinning. I hesitated there because it's really important that we learn to get angry but not sin. It says, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. And so we need to realize that these are some indicators if we're growing in wisdom. Now, we live in a culture which pushes us to act as though there's never enough time. We're constantly rushing with every moment of time, absorbed with our desire to be connected and be productive. Now, you may have noticed there's a, a big watch up here in the platform. Hey, Big watches are in style, okay? Even for ladies, I mean, the bigger the better. So I went and got the biggest one I could find, you know? And it says, and the next point I want to make is be responsible. Verse 16 says, making the best use of time. The New King James Version reads that we need to redeem the time. And Paul says the wise are making the best use of their time. I was thinking about this, how tempting uh, it would be for us to automate everything. You guys remember the Jetsons, right? Yeah, that was a pretty cool futuristic cartoon there. All things are happening and what, what went on. But you can tell Alexa good night and she'll turn off all the lights for you. Now, I say she because I'm not really sure. Maybe that's where the confusion started, okay, with Alexa. Okay, <laughs> if we have an extra smartphone or extra smart house, she'll lock all the doors and set the temperature. 
All this happens by speaking a word. There's less getting up and moving around. And this is fantastic. I mean, think about the things that we can accomplish because of technology. Now, if you're younger here today, you've grown up in the world of technology. We didn't have it, all right? My mother couldn't track me down. <laughs> she had no idea where I was at. My mom worked full time, raising three boys alone. And when she left for work, I lived up in Niagara Falls. When she left for work, sometimes we'd plan to go swimming in Canada. <laughs> we had a store that we could redeem coupons at. They'd give us cash, discounted price. They made more money on the coupons. And we'd go and we'd pay our toll at the, at the bridge. We'd go through customs and we'd go swim at Dufferin Islands, great swim spot, right, at, right by the falls on the Canadian side. Got all that cold water coming in. We'd swim all day long. Okay, it's time, boom, jump on our bikes, scurry back home. My mother come home from work, so what did you do today? Hmm, not too much, Ma, it was kind of a boring day. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was in another country. <laughs> all right? So technology has been fantastic. But let me ask you a question this morning. What do we do with the extra time? What do we do with the extra time? It seems like the more time we have, the more time we need, and the more time we want. Often wanted to use it for ourselves. Wise people don't spend all their free time. They invest it. I want to say that again because I think that's really important. Wise people don't spend all their free time. They invest it. They invest it in things that are lasting and things that are eternal. The Bible tells us that we're to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. And we also know that if we have large blocks of time with unplanned and unaccountable time, it's very easy to fall in temptation during those times. So time is really important. We need to know what time it is. And, and, Paul, and Paul says in here, why do we know, need to know what time it is? Because the days are evil. This present age is filled with wickedness and temptation. A wise person knows that life can also be fleeting. In James uh, chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, it says, um, Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Now, that can be a little discouraging when you think about it, like, I'm gone, you know. <laughs> but you know what? Life is short and compared to all eternity. So we need to ask ourselves, how, how am I investing my time? And the days are evil. I, I don't dwell on that for sure. And do I think they're going to get any better? No, I don't. Can't imagine that. I think evil is going to increase. But that's Okay because God will be with us as we go through that and deal with it, all right? But we're to invest our, our, in things that are eternal and lasting. And then we go to verse 17, and it says, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now, I believe the Lord has a will for each one of our lives, but I also believe that his revealed will is found in the scriptures. We need to be forever growing in the act of godly living, learning to apply the revealed truth of Scripture to the daily circumstances of our life. And then we go on to verse 18, and it says, And do not be drunk with wine, for that is as debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And that's what we need to do. We need to be filled with the Spirit. Instead of giving yourself over to fleshly passions and being are driven by earthly things. And Paul's referring to drinking to the point of drunkenness. The, uh, <clears throat> be driven and controlled by the Holy Spirit so you can carefully and soberly do God's will. Now, debauchery is a, is a strange word. I mean, it's not a word that we use. I mean, has anybody used debauchery lately? Okay. Like I said, it's the polar opposite of godliness. It's extreme indulgence in bodily pleasures. 
It encompasses several aspects of unholy living, including but not limited to sexual immorality. It talks about drunkenness and crude talk and really generally out of control behavior. Kind of like, you know, if we were going to put one word to it, it'd be partying. I mean, it's just, you know, out there and going crazy. It characterizes those who don't know Christ. And every, uh, everything stated in Ephesians up to this point would indicate to you and I that the believer is in the spirit and the believer and the spirit is in the believer. From the moment we received Christ as Savior, the Bible tells us that the spirit came to live inside of us. Now, I know there's a battle between the flesh and the spirit. And we need to learn how to let the Spirit dominate our lives and be more part of our lives. But Paul's not saying we need to receive more of the Spirit or have some new experience of the Spirit. But we need to learn to walk in the Spirit, to be filled and Spirit-controlled day by day. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because I know Pastor Tony and I talked about this. And I know he's going to, at some point, bring a... Uh, a midweek teaching, I think, to what it is to really be filled with the Spirit. I'm excited about that. But it's not something new that has to happen in our lives. You got all the Spirit you need. We're filled as much as we need to be filled, but we got to learn how to allow that to operate in our lives. We got to learn how to walk in the Spirit and, and, and live life according to the Spirit. Listen to what it says in Romans uh, chapter 8. It says, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their, mind, set their minds on things of the spirit, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on things of the spirit. I think I messed that up. Um, yeah, okay, you caught it. Uh, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, if anyone who, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Belonging to Christ is to have his spirit. To walk in the spirit and be filled with the spirit is when we give the spirit control of our lives. When we live not for the things of this world, but for the things of God. When we seek to please God and not ourselves. When we walk worthy of the calling. The result of such filling by the spirit is really contained in the actions of Verses 19 and 20. We need to understand that. Oh, I got my. See, that wasn't. Yeah, okay, no, I'm okay. I thought I got, I thought I got out of order here. Okay. We need to understand that these activities that Paul's talking about are not what we do in order to get the Spirit to fill us, but these are the activities which flow as a result of the Spirit's work in our hearts and in our lives. This is what wisdom looks like, and this is what. The spirit filling brings. The spirit filling brings a life composed of songs and hymns and, and worship, praise. It says, make a melody to the Lord. Addressing one another. And I think this really involves corporate worship. Again, I want to stress to you that there's nothing like being in worship together. It's really important that we do that. It's biblical. It's important. Now, I'll just say this. Okay, I was the youngest of three. My uh, middle brother was actually a singer. All right? Uh, when he was in his teenage years, he sang in gospel groups. He traveled all over the place and sang in all kinds of situations. You know, he even made vinyl records. Remember those? <laughs> he was like 13, 14 years old, and he's in the studio making records. He could sing. I can't sing. All right? My wife will tell you that. If I sit next to her and there's people around me and I start singing, I get a little too carried away. She kind of, sometimes she'll nudge me and, you know. 
I could drive you out of here if I started singing. You'd be like, oh, I can't take it. <laughs> and you run out. <laughs> no, seriously, I can't sing. But you know what? When it comes to the Lord, I've learned over the years, I used to not sing because I can't sing. But you know what? I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing. I'm going to praise the Lord. And I think this really comes down to corporate worship. Because we've got to remember that Paul's addressing the church. We need to assemble to sing praise to God. We need to assemble to give thanks to God. We need to assemble to encourage one another. I don't know if you ever thought about worship in this way. Now, when we worship as a congregation, our praise is certainly directed to God and not man. We experienced that this morning. We're to uplift the Lord and praise him and honor him. But as we worship, we are in fact addressing one another. We're declaring things about God that are true. Our words are also for the benefit of one another. In hymns and songs, we express our struggles and joys, our faith, our doubts. We encourage one another to look to God. When we worship together, those whose faith is weak will become strengthened by those who are strong. Those who are discouraged will be carried along and uplifted by the voices of those who are in uh, that moment encouraged in the Lord. You ever been in a situation where maybe you, you come to church and, you, I mean, things are not going well, you, whatever's going on in your life, and you get into worship and maybe you don't, you're not even worshiping. You don't feel like, you, you know, you don't feel like worshiping. But man, you hear other people singing and worshiping God, and all of a sudden something happens in us where we say, yeah. And we begin to worship God ourselves in that moment. And so we receive strength from each other. And this is, a, I think, what Paul is somewhat referring to, that we come together. It's not like we got to walk in the door singing a song, all right? But we come together in worship. I mean, it's, it's, it's so important. And our unity with one another is communicated and strengthened at that moment. And the next thing Paul encourages us to do is be thankful. Verse 20 says, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see that this is the kind of thankful hearts that we should have. We should always be thankful. And it says, for everything. For everything. It's really important that we get that part of it. Every prayer should begin with a recognition of the blessing of God and what he's given us in our life. Because it makes our good times better. And it makes our difficult prayers better. We walk through times of joy and times of pain and trial. We know that God has blessed us. We must be grateful for every moment of life because they're all a gift from God. God even works out our difficult moments for our good. And then it says in verse 21, it says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And Paul's saying when we're walking in wisdom and when we're filled with the Spirit, when we're giving thanks in all things, we become submitted to one another. And we do that out of reverence for Christ. Out of respect for who Jesus is. We need to be reverent to one another. It's not based on the merits of the other person or because others deserve it. It's because Christ and who he is and what he has done for us that we begin to value one another. There's so many passages related to us preferring one another above ourselves. Romans 12.10 says, outdo one another in showing honor. We're told to build one another up, to love one another as Christ loved us. We're told to be kind and tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God is, in Christ has forgiven us. We're told with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. And we all, we do all of this. It's all done out of reverence for Christ. Because of what Jesus has done for us, we need to revere and hold each other in high esteem. I close with this illustration. The Levere in Paris, is, that's the English way of saying it. Levere. Okay, okay. The Levere in Paris is perhaps the most famous art museum in the world. 
It displays originals by masters such as Michelangelo, Rubens, Da Vinci, Vermeer, and many others. And since 1793, the Levere has encouraged inspiring artists to come and copy the masters. Some of our most famous modern artists have done that and have become better painters by copying the best the world has ever known. In an article in Smithsonian Magazine, tells us about Amel Dagger, a 63-year-old man who was, who was duplicating art at the Levere for over 30 years. Dagger remains in awe of the masters and continues to learn from them. He says, if you're too satisfied with yourself, you can't improve. And Paul instructed us in the beginning of chapter 5, verse 1, to be imitators of Christ. In his first letter to the Thessalonians, he commended the believers because they were becoming like the Lord and setting an example for others. Like the Levere copyist, We'll never reach perfection before we get to heaven. Even so, we must resist the temptation to be satisfied with our present imitation of Jesus. We need to keep looking to him, learning from him, and asking him for his help. Let's copy the master. Be wise, be filled. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you this morning, Lord, for our time together. Thank you for your word that just guides and directs us through life. And Lord, I pray for myself and I pray for uh, those that are listening today. God, that you'd help us to grow in wisdom. Not worldly wisdom, godly wisdom. And God, you'd learn and teach us how to walk in the spirit. That we'd allow that uh, spirit that's in us, your Holy Spirit, to that not only would it fill us up, but it would overflow out of our lives and reach others. And God, I pray that we would be an imitator of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.